All right, so we will go, again, uh, go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Miranda Hitchcock. I'm one of the founders of Every Dog Behavior and Training. So we are a nonprofit here in Austin, and our goal is to make sure that everyone has access to behavior and training resources. I know some of you are joining from outside the Austin area, and that's great too, uh, but we do offer free services and outreach services, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so if anybody is interested, you can book a free consult with us. And then if you want ongoing training, we can provide that as well as funneling you to people like Jen. Um, and we work with a lot of the trainers in town. So we know who might be a good fit for whatever you're working through. Um, and because we are a nonprofit, there are a couple of things that I like to ask from everyone. One of them is to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We post lots of cute puppies and other stuff there. Um, you can also follow conscious dog training on Facebook and Instagram. Oh, yeah. Um, and if if you like your uh, your time with us tonight we would love it if you wrote us a review on Google or on Facebook um, and again if you want to book a session that's awesome if you happen to know anyone with a fearful dog we are just introing a $10 fearful dogs class it's a support group every other week on Monday evenings and it's a great time if you have fearful dogs to connect with other owners and with a trainer to get some training tips and also some moral support um, so lots of cool stuff going on and we do webinars about every two weeks, um, including a general webinar for new dog owners, as well as all kinds of stuff from different trainers in town on a variety of topics. So stay tuned, check our website, um, and we'd love to see you back for more, more webinars. So with that all being said, um, I'm going to pass things along to Jen. We'd love to have you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit yeah. about yourself, and then we'll talk about sure. kids and dogs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Jen Burns. I am a certified professional dog trainer and behavior consultant. My dog training journey started in around 2004 when I had an out of control lab boxer mix that uh, gave me a run for my money, literally, uh, and home. And my background is has dealt a lot with kids. So um, a lot of volunteer work, uh, preschool, um, a lot of early education, studying, um, I was a nanny, I have a master's in psychology, um, and then I like to tell people this because I think it's helpful to understand, but I really thought I knew kids and dogs. I thought I had a handle on it, I thought I had empathy, I thought I had compassion, I've done the nannying and the babysitting, and I've done behavior consulting and behavior modification, and I've done pretty much all the things. Um, but it wasn't until I had tiny humans in my own house, tiny humans and puppies, and then tiny humans and board and trains, that I really gained not only this understanding of, you know, kids and dogs and boundaries, but what it was like for real life. Like, what is it like in the morning for uh, not just up and coming parents, uh, but the current parents, what it's like to get up in the morning, try to take care of your puppy, try to get kids ready for school, try to get lunches, try to get them in the car, try to get them to school. Um, and I think we can all agree, most of us are dog lovers, and many of us had the privilege and the honor to grow up with dogs. Um, and I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. I think there's so much to learn. And I see a lot of things go wrong. So when I tell you these things that I'm about to share, I share them not only from a behavior background with dogs, but also a personal experience of having tiny humans. Um, and dogs in the same house, um, even dogs with behavior modification issues and, and the different types of things and even tiny humans and birthday parties and all the things. So um, we're gonna go over this um, and hopefully with that introduction, you don't think I'm the devil because I love kids and I love dogs and I think they're beautiful together. So with that, we're gonna get started. Okay, so I own Conscious Dog Training. We run several puppy groups, um, an online course, and we are all over the Austin and surrounding areas. We work with um, everything from puppies to severe behavior modification, and we'll get started. Okay, so kids and dogs. I'm gonna start here again, just to show you some really cute pictures. Um, some of these are from the interwebs. Uh, on Instagram, and then some of these will be my friends uh, and possibly the tiny humans of mine that send me pictures because I need faith in humanity of cute kids and dog sick because I see so many bad situations. And I, to be fair, I see a lot of bad situations. I see uh, dog to dog resource guarding around children. I see children getting bitten in the face. 
Um, I see a lot of things. So sometimes I request my friends to send me cute pictures because I need that space. All right. Here's a few more. We're going to go over these a little bit later. Um, super cute. And, and why these are cute. So take it in and kind of look at them. And um, there's so many things to touch on on this. So there's preparing for puppies. So adding a puppy to a young or a new family. Um, adding an adult dog to a family. So we love rescuing dogs. Um, but that can be another challenge. And then preparing for a baby. So if you already have a dog and now you're adding a baby to the family. So there's a lot of things to touch on. But today I really want to focus on um, awareness and education and general guidelines. And hopefully that will help all the situations. And I'm more than happy to do another webinar on each topic because each one truly deserves an hour in and of itself, to be honest. Okay, so here are the common signs of stress and anxiety. There's a whole list and we're going to go over them, but these are the most common that I see with kids and dogs and some of the most obvious. So there's a lip flick or a nose flick, looks kind of like an iguana. I'll, um, I have some examples. There's a half moon eye, um, also called a whale eye. It's when you can literally see a half moon in the whites of their eyes and I've got examples. Um, panting a look away or a head turn. So it'll look like avoidance. Like if I don't see you, this isn't happening. Um, spontaneous dandruff. So suddenly you're looking at your dog and all of a sudden there's white, it looks like dry skin or dandruff. That's a very legitimate thing. Moving away. So even just moving your body position away, a yawn, a paw lift, and a closed tense mouth. So I want you guys to really take this in and we will move on. Here's a really nice, this is one of my favorites. This is Dr. Marty Becker. And I'm gonna be um, referencing a lot of people in this as well. Um, but these are a lot of different things you can look for. So signs of anxiety and fear. And a lot of these are slight. These are not things that everyone's going to notice. So I do ask that people really take notice of this so you can start to read because prevention and proaction is really the key to kids and dogs. Um, here's some more doggy language. It's a little bit, um, little bit blurry, but just to give you an idea, these are all over the internet. I would recommend that everybody um, takes a look at this because I think what we think is, you know, maybe an outburst or a dog that's uncomfortable is actually way beyond the ladder of discomfort. It starts, you know, very low and slowly goes up the ladder. And, and I think dogs generally are desperately trying to give us signs that they're uncomfortable. Um, so this one right here, this coward, I need space, um, this anxious ears back, uh, defensive hind end stance, and lots of different things we can notice and things that often get misconstrued. Here's another one. So the licking of the lips, the panting, the brows furrowed, major cowering, slight, moving in slow motion. So you'll see that a lot around kids, acting sleepy or yawning hypervigilance, moving away, pacing, and then suddenly won't eat. So if you're trying to reward your dog and suddenly there's no food that's being taken, that's a really nice sign that that dog is experiencing something. I like to say that the cup runneth over, that something is too much and it inhibits their ability to eat or take food. Um, so I'm gonna hopefully bring this up, hopefully the interwebs work with me. As I close out all of my million 20,000 emails. All right, let's see if this pops up. So this is a very common cute video on the dodo. And um, this, the dodo, uh, bless their hearts, uh, sends out a lot of kid and dog information. All I see is a slow motion horror film here. Just, oh my gosh, why? I have so many questions. Why is that dog? unsupervised next to a children's bed. Um, why is that child learning that it's okay to roll on the dog when it's desperately just trying to rest? And I mean, bless this sweet dog as well. It's unbelievable tolerance. Hey, Jen, but I think, yeah, in, yeah. Sorry. I don't think, uh, I can't see the video. I know Wendy said the same thing. We're still seeing the PowerPoint, but the video isn't coming up. Fine. All right, let me tell you what's happening. This on the dodo, it's a cute um, baby crawling out of its bed and rolling and tumbling on top of a dog. So the dog is unsupervised in a baby's room, likely a toddler. And um, the toddler comes out of the room and 
the dodo is saying, this is so cute. This is this um, kid's best friend. And to me, it's just a slow motion horror film. I'm glad you told me. I put these on here, but I had a feeling they wouldn't load. Um, but that's okay. I have pictures. <laughs> okay, so these are also from the interwebs. Um, and I just want to point some things out here. So here, uh, we're, we see a lot of hugging. All three of these pictures are hugging. In the first one, you can see the half moon eye. The ears are back, not only because the child is holding, um, but you can also see there's a paw lift down below and some movement away from the child. So this dog is, can I get some, plate, some space, please? Um, here we see a yawn. If you look at kid and dog pics, if you just uh, hashtag kids and dogs, dogs and kids, um, nanny dogs on Instagram, you're going to see a bunch of pictures and the majority of them are, are not actually going to be cute. I hate to say that, which is why I tried to leave a lot of happy pictures. Um, but you're going to see a lot of tongue flicks, a lot of yawning, a lot of this. Um, and one of my favorite kids and dog resources is Family Paws Parent Education. I highly recommend anyone and everyone to uh, check out their site and there'll be some resources from them as well. Um, and they should really call it a kiss to di dismiss. So what we often think of as like a lick um, in a nice loving way, it's also, it can also be, and it depends on context, a kiss to dismiss, meaning I see you, I really would prefer not to escalate, but I also really need you to go away. And again, we see this here with the pinned ears, um, the tongue slit, the lick, and the eyes in that third picture. Um, and again, we see a kid um, straddling a dog. You see a closed mouth, um, a little bit of a furrowed brow there. To me, I don't like labeling feelings. I like to see things that are measurable and observable, but sometimes that doesn't translate to normal human language. This does not look like a happy dog. We also have some penis crowning here down below which can also be a sign of stress that's really nice to pay attention to so this dog is i would say if i had to label it which i don't again like putting feelings onto a dog but generally that entire context means this dog is not a happy dog in this moment um you can see this here another cute dog pick this dog is definitely concerned about what is happening in between um, him and his friend. Now the dog on the, um, on the other side of the golden doesn't look as concerned, but we do see an open mouth. We see a little bit of stress in the face, a little bit of a furrowed brow. Um, so I'm not saying that this dog is content, um, but this one is definitely, you can see the body language moving away from the child in between. And then again, um, we see this one here. We see the white, um, the half moon eye. We see the pinned ears um, and a tight closed mouth. So all of these, to me, I take my breath away. Um, and to me, I would say we are, I don't care how tolerant these dogs are, we are on a ticking clock with all of these. Um, the only reason your kid doesn't get bitten in any of these situations is one, your dog is a saint, um, or two, luck really harsh but that is accurate and again this is one of the things that is really disheartening um, even horses we even condition horses to get ridden for years and um, your dog is not a horse it is not a pony it is not a stuffed animal and um, again as we're talking about body language I think it's pretty evident that these dogs are not comfortable and happy and um, this is a big thing so getting in a dog's face Riding a dog, hugging a dog, um, and unsolicited touch and approach are some of the biggest things I see. And, and honestly, um, when I go into houses and I see a lot of dogs moving around with toddlers on the move, toddlers almost always have something in their hand. They also <laughs> almost always have food on their face, which is also adorable. But for a dog, that's free game to lick. Generally, that makes the parent possibly upset because sometimes they knock a kid down and now we're in this yelling at the dog for just being a dog and then the toddler's going to be touching the dog right in the dog's face and again it's another recipe um, for um, unsolicited unfavorable touch and interaction and I can tell you the amount of times I don't want to but um, it's countless how many I've how many places I've gone into and I try to be strict and I try to be clear and I try to be 
very black and white and even still the bite happens and it takes my breath away every single time and it's a tragedy um, to the extent that when I give people the feedback about these are the strict guidelines that I'm going to put for you and your child, I make them sign a contract saying that they have um, heard it and they have taken the advice and it was given to them and they are aware of the professional advice that I gave them because um, it has become such an issue. And, and all dogs bite. It does not matter breed. It does not matter age. Um, dogs bite. Every dog bites. Um, every dog has the capacity to bite. It doesn't matter if it's a golden or a mountain dog um, or a pity. It just doesn't matter. I don't, it, none of it matters. Again, <laughs> just to get this point home, um, we see closed mouth hugging. Um, those eyes, we see this another uh, face invasion here and here. Oof, this one, this third one really gives me the heebie jeebies here. I would hope this dog would get up and move away, um, but we see the eyes, we see the ears, we see the defensive stance being taken. A quick snap to this baby's face, I think, would be fair, um, and it would happen faster than you ever knew what, what happened, um, and you likely wouldn't even see it happen if you're already this in too deep. And just because I, I, I really see a lot of bites, um, right here, this close talking. Uh, for dogs, this is the equivalent of going into a bar and headbutting another human. Um, this close face to face is not ideal, especially if there's not a reinforcement history there or what I would call an emotional bank account. So every time you reward your dog or you have a nice reinforcement history or interaction that's a deposit into their emotional bank account and um, when you need to make a withdrawal or maybe you know call them away from something you're not in the negative for most of these kids they start out in the negative there is no reinforcement history and if you think about it most of the time parents spend a lot of the time correcting so not only is there not a positive emotional bank account typically it already is starting in the negative so this again absent or Lack of supervision here is frightening. Um, and this is high arousal um, water type of situation where the toddler's holding the hose and the dog is already in a high arousal state. Um, makes me <laughs> nervous. All right, so I'm gonna play this. Um, this was given to me with permission to post. Um, so I already gave apologies in advance. Um, I don't know if you can see it already, but you're already seeing ears, ears action and um, no parent in between here. Um, hopefully you can see this one. There's a lip flick, a turn away, dog moves away, gives a tongue flick. Turn away, tongue flick, look away. I don't know how many we can count. I lost count already. Tongue flick. Oh, yep, and oh, wow. So right there, oh man, yeah. So, so many interactions that we could be shaping here. Dog luckily moves away, that's super sweet. I would expect a kiss to dismiss right there as well, just as like a please, this is my last, absolute last attempt, please. So that right there is something that when I go into houses and I see, it's like a full hard stop for me. Um, okay, here's another one. Uh, thank you, Erica. Um, now, these kids loved this dog, and, and this dog really loved these kids, and she was a saint, but in this moment, this dog was not thrilled, so ears pinned, her ears normally didn't look like that, and we already see a tongue flick. Um, so best intentions, but without being able to read the dog, these intentions really start to go awry. All right, <laughs> so now that we had a little bit of a horror show, let's talk about some moments that are actually cute and why. All right, so we started with these. I love this one. This is inclusion um, without force. Notice that the child on the left, who's also the child on the right, is not reaching for this dog that's a puppy. She's minding her own business. The puppy is there by choice. He can move at any time. Um, and again, over here, she actually brought her laptop over to a sleeping puppy in an X10, which I thought was adorable. And she just wants to spend time doing nothing, isn't touching the puppy while um, she's sleeping. I think that these both are lovely, lovely examples, and that's why. Um, this is my Sooner dog, this black dog. Um, he is a 
obsessed with children. Um, one thing you can see here is he's leaning in. He's got that nice open mouth. He has soft, rounded, um, almond-shaped eyes. He's leaning into the pet. Um, and the child here, she's a little bit older, but she's not overbearing. She's not looming over him. She's petting with one hand. Here I wanted to show this one because <laughs> he actually loves this. Um, invite him up on the couch you can actually see he's starting his trust fall so if you look at his bottom he's actually tipping um he loves that but that is something that i know that he absolutely loves but notice the difference in his face he has an open mouth um no signs of stress he is just like this is his that's his best life um and they know that so um and he actually paused them when he solicits this like, type of petting um, so this is obviously with supervision um, and knowing that this is something that this particular dog actually finds very reinforcing. He loves it. I have so many pictures of him just falling. Um, he will literally back up and just lean into you for love. Um, and these are, again, super adorable. This dog right here, um, I wouldn't say this is a panting. This is just sort of a relaxed face. Um, this child is standing. She has her arm loosely over him. The dog can freely leave at any time and it's choosing not to. Um, rather than sleeping on the dog, this dog is obviously curled up with its tiny human, very relaxed face here, relaxed body. Um, I love uh, his body language with the dog, the, the boy's body language with the dog. That's very sweet, not overbearing. Um, these are the pictures that I actually do really love. And again, here, um, this tiny human is Avalyn. She was on the floor and this dog came up um, and did this and they had a nice relationship prior to this. So again, this is inclusion um, without force and this is the dog's choice to come to the tinies. <laughs> and a little bit more, this is with a baby puppy. Again, you're seeing um, a nice sit. This puppy knew how to sit um, and she's barely touching him. So this isn't about clobbering the puppy. I love this. This is because it's another inclusion um and again a soft hand a single hand um i even love how she's positioned so she's not looming over um sometimes out in exposed hands can be very um stressful for a dog and again this is another one this dog loves to do this um she's happy this was her best life she loved putting up a paw um and she came up to this tiny human um and then again here they came up to the dogs who are in seatbelts, but desperately wanting to come out and play. Um, and I love um, here on the left is using um, hands underneath. And <laughs> I think Adeline's here is just trying to contain baby Bogey because he's excited to see her. More cute pictures, just so you don't think I'm the devil. Um, I love Adeline's uh, positioning here. She's not even touching Elijah. Um, he went up to them and showed his belly and that's something he really, really loves to do. And notice that they're bending down, touching him and it was solicited <laughs> in here. Um, Olaf had had a surgery, so he was separated, so he didn't hurt himself. Um, and they wanted to spend time with him. And so they went into his enclosure, which I thought was super sweet. But notice there's no touching. They're not holding him. There's no touching. He's allowed to be a dog and keep all four paws on the floor. Here's another one with a nice puppy. She's using toys to redirect here. She's also over 13. And then another one, here's um, two more puppies and she's using toys again. So lovely, lovely pictures here. And again, because I just love when my friends, I truly love when my friends send me cute dog pics. Um, so these two on the left, the blonde sailor and her puppy Copper, they grew up together. Um, he goes everywhere she goes. Um, they are basically inseparable. Um, she was sleeping here first, and he typically crawls up into her space, um, and it's, he loves this. This is his best life. If he could do anything, he'd be doing this. This is another dog. Again, notice that the kids are doing their own thing, and this is obviously the dog's choice to come up and put his head there. Um, he has his bed. They're hanging out more than likely by the cord, but I love that it is um, a respect a nice respect of the dog's space, and it allows the dog to really grow up with the kids in a nice, low stress way. So now we're gonna go into types of supervision to make these types of situations occur. Um, again, this is from Family Paws Parent Education. Highly recommend them. They have endless resources. Um, I am not um, certified through them. It's one of my goals, um, but they have lovely, lovely resources and I um, shared with permission. 
Um, so this is absent. This is what we see a lot. So the adult is either not in the room with the dog and the baby and the toddler. So um, there's free access here. So that's like the video that you couldn't see that I was showing you. Passive is you're cooking dinner. Um, you're in the location, but you're distracted and not watching. And if something were to happen, there's absolutely no way that you could even respond. Then there's reactive, where you only do something after the dog or child is too close. There's proactive and active, which are the two that I'm going to recommend. We never recommend one, two, or three. The four is proactive, so you're making plans to be safe um, and safe, happy separation. And then five is active. So Family Pause frequently says, um, <laughs> dog and baby on the scene, parent in between. So these are wonderful examples of um, a parent being in between um, and it's full active supervision. The number and website for Family Pause is listed below. So some of the do's and don'ts, again, this is gonna be from Family Pause. Um, do not allow kids and dogs to navigate tight spaces. And man, I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard kids cornering dogs in a doorway closet and getting bitten in the face. I, again, I actually don't have a count on it. Um, so the flip side of that is do create an open layout, as open as you can, move furniture around and try to avoid tight spaces. And this includes thresholds. Um, do not allow a children to come into a dog space. That's why I had all of those pictures because that is, those were all examples of the dogs coming into the kids' spaces. Do not allow a dog to corner them or um, do not allow a kid to corner a dog or come into their space. So on the flip side of that, we call these success stations. So these are stations not only for your dog, but also for your child, so that both can be happily separated. So you might use a Kong or a food puzzle or a chew or a bone, and then you can be with your child. Maybe you're reading, maybe you're playing, maybe you're doing a nighttime bedtime routine, maybe you're feeding, um, lots of things you can be doing here. And um, the other dog or the dog is on the other side, safely um, separated. And I even love the blanket here. So many, you know, curious, babies on the move will go up and stick their fingers through, but still that's an approach. So this picture gives a great example of um, even limiting um, eyesight there. So here are some do's and don'ts for the babies. Um, so you can invite a dog over to sniff, but do not force the interaction. You want to include the dog in a comfortable, safe way, and we're going to go over this, but here the dog is tethered, it has a food puzzle, and you're, you know, with the baby. Don't isolate the dog. I mean, you got a dog, you also chose a baby, of course, um, but inclusion is really important. Um, we don't want the dog to associate a new addition into the family, and then you're just leaving the dog outside or separated. You really do want to close the dog to the door to the nursery if you are not in there and do not allow unsupervised access. And um, most of the things you read in the news are lack of supervision or complete unsupervision. Um, make sure you reward your dog, keep the reinforcement up. Make sure you have a relationship before you have a baby. If you are pregnant, there are a variety of behaviors that your dog should start to know and that's for another day, but do keep the training up. And if you can't do it, solicit some professional help, a dog walker, I'll get into that in our sanity savers. Um, and don't scold curiosity. We're gonna get into, I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, but you do want to secure your dog and use awake adult supervision. And again, I just like, I can't say it enough, neither can family balls. Don't ever leave a dog and a baby unsupervised. For toddlers, again, we're still going to use a gate and create a success station. You do not want to allow access to the dog's food, toys, or treats. You do want to create some inclusionary um, activities, so some parent-guided games, which I will show you. Um, you do not want the dog and toddler to play at any uh, alone at any time and more success stations, active supervision, again, inviting the dog over, but do not allow your toddler to approach. Um, and if you're away, if there's a babysitter, make sure the dog is in a crate or a bedroom and it's not your babysitter's responsibility um, or uh, to take care of your dog and your toddler. So here's some age guidelines. Under seven is always active supervision. Um, or so I said dog and baby on the scene, parent in between. No independent in unsupervised interactions. There should be nothing that you are not actively seeing. Um, when I go into places and people say, I don't know what happened, that is not um, active supervision. So um, 
some things that the kids can do with you is if you're clicker training or using a verbal marker, they can give a cookie or toss a cookie when you click. So you can do some of the timing work and the kids can give the cookie or toss the cookie. Um, vice versa, they can say or give a cue and you can um, reward. So you can do a back and forth there. Um, they can help you toss a toy. There's contingencies there. I like to teach dogs default so that there's no jumping. So you want to make sure that there's no jumping when they do toss a toy. You want structured interactions. Um, so basically rules of the game, both for the child and the dog, so that both parties know. Absolutely no chase. No free chase. Uh, no chasing the dog. No chasing the kids. It should not be something that's allowed. I much prefer the kids to be elevated or separated using some sort of separation, which I'll show you, or be in between, and again, tossing a toy with consideration, so having default behaviors. 7 to 13, they can participate a little bit more in training and overall care. Do not expect full responsibility. So often we go into these puppies um, or even older dogs, and my clients will say that they got the dog for the child. and almost never has that worked out for them. Um, they're not ready for full responsibility. If they are, that's the rarity, not the norm. Do not expect unsupervised walks. Man, this is a huge one. Um, clients get the dogs and they expect their kids to be able to walk them. Here in Austin, we have a lot of dog-to-dog -dog issues um, and a lot of dogs running off leash. And um, not only is it dangerous for your dog, it's also dangerous for your child. Um, they should not have to you know, be prepared or have to cope with off-leash dogs. Um, and just overall, I, I don't think unsupervised walks with large dogs or out of control dogs are, are safe, really. Um, they can have a little bit more time with the dogs with known histories and full emotional bank accounts. Like my dog Sooner would be a wonderful example. Um, I can have a little less active supervision, but it's not absent. Um, I would never leave any child of this age unsupervised with a puppy because they can inadvertently reinforce things that you're not wanting. They can also reinforce biting, nipping. Um, kids will almost always get excited, which is usually exciting for a puppy. And they still need to learn appropriate and safe interactions with clear, succinct, directive guidelines. And that can be when Fido is doing this, you may do this, you may not do this. So um, uh, your dogs and puppies are not um, stuffed animals. So that's one thing I start to see a lot, a lot of growling upon picking, being picked up, and then growling upon being approached. Um, even for 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old kids, they get so excited with a the puppy, they just want to pick them up and snuggle them, and that will inevitably create a lot of growling. So um, even this age needs a lot of assistance um, and clear, direct guidelines. 13 plus, they can start having more responsibility. It really depends on the kids. I've seen some uber responsible 13 year olds, um, but every now and again, you know, the kids, kids still. Um, it's still not a great time to get a dog or a puppy exclusively for a child, and they still need feedback and specific instructions, such as not picking up the puppy, not sticking your face in another dog's face, not taking items. So with puppies, they tend to explore the world with their mouths. Um, kids will chase and take items, and eventually that puppy is not going to want to give items up, which will inevitably re lead to resource guarding. Um, coming home and leaving nice and calm, and then how to properly care for a dog, including feeding, um, taking a harness off if a dog is having any sort of collar issue. I've got a client that has a lab, and whenever he swims, the collar really needs to come off because he can have a reaction to the water. And, and can get an infection. So they just need to look, know how to properly care for the dog and all about personal space. So what can you do? So do keep dogs and kids separated, especially toddlers. Toddlers on the move can be unpredictable for a human. I mean, if you have a toddler, you know that you're like, oh my God, what are they doing now? And we, we toddler proof and baby proof our house. And the same is true. So um, it's really hard for a dog to predict a toddler, which can create undue stress and anxiety. So you want to create success stations for safe separation. So baby gates, um, freestanding gates, lots of solutions. Do teach kids how to pet with one hand and where and how to pet. So I often, with toddlers, because they lack the dexterity, will guide their hand with me. Um, and they'll be in my lap or they'll be next to me just so they can figure out what's the proper way, not just for your dog, but eventually when COVID ends, your child will be around other children and other dogs. Um, and this is overall safety. 
do teach, do teach them proper solutions and good choices, how to read dogs. I'm starting to go really fast because we're running out of time, but the Dog Decoder app is lovely. There's a doggy body language book, and there's even a dog on crazy board game, all of which I recommend. Um, do implement shared time with your kids and dogs so that they can grow together and learn positive interaction. There's so many things we can learn from kids and dogs, um, but you do want to be proactive and make sure that you're meeting the needs of your dog and your kids. So it's just because you had kids doesn't mean your dog doesn't need a walk. Um, just because you had a baby doesn't mean your dog doesn't need enrichment or interaction anymore or training. Focus on present prevention. Have an idea of what to do when. So when you are expecting a future dog or when you're getting your baby, what do you want to happen when the door opens? Where do you want your dog to be when you're feeding? Where do you want your puppy to be when the kids come home from school? So whether you're getting a puppy or an adult dog, you really want to look into your future. and Where do I want my dog for feeding? What do I want to do when the kids come home from home? Where do we want the dog to be when the kids are eating? Do we want the dog on the couch? Do we not? And start preparing that so you're setting your kid and your dog up for success. Teach your kids to stand like a tree. Um, tons of information on the internet. And um, do get support from a professional trainer so that you're not lost. I would say being proactive is the number one thing you can do. Focus on inclusion. Expect to be overwhelmed. Kids and dogs is really hard. I don't think I had the understanding, full understanding until I did it myself. Um, do make clear checklists. So if you want to use a whiteboard or some pretty creative list, have a list for the kids to do so that they can uh, mark off their specific tasks to really include them into the process. Be clear, clear as kind. Thank you, Brene Brown, both for your kid and your dog. So being really clear about where you want the kids to be, rewarding the kids, rewarding the dog. And do please prepare an older dog for a baby on the way. That can be extremely traumatic, um, which again is for another day. We've already talked a lot about success stations. Tethering is an example. This is not like a torture device. This is just tethering your dog potentially to um, a notch on the wall, a door, a piece of furniture. You want them to be super comfortable. Um, you want to be able to toss treats, make it really rewarding. It's a great way to, again, provide separation safely. Crates can be wonderful options, but make sure they're still rewarding and you want to make sure that your dog is enjoying it. If your dog has any sort of confinement anxiety, a crate is a no-go. And then freestanding gates are lovely. So that also starts um, with teaching your dog how to be separated. Many of our dogs, especially our COVID dogs, have never been separated before. So one of my first recommendations is always a gate and um, short interactions and repetitions of separation. Do not allow kids and dogs to navigate tight spaces. We said that. Do not allow kids to approach dogs while eating, resting, or playing. Do not allow kids um, chewing, resting, or toys. Yes, that's a repeat. Obviously, I wanted to say that a lot. Do not allow kids to hug dogs, to hang on them, ride them, or climb them. They are not toys. They are living, breathing animals with feelings and emotions. Um, do never, ever leave them unsupervised. Do not assume that your dog loves kids or that your dog will never bite. All dogs bite. Do not allow your kids to consistently take things, um, to pick up a dog or a puppy. Never, ever, ever, ever use a shot collar or punish a growl. A growl is a warning. Trust me, you want that warning. That's the warning before an escalation. Um, using a shot collar can be so damaging and dangerous around a child because we never know what that dog is going to associate the shock to. So if your child is approaching and your dog has given a growl and now you shock, you have essentially punished and provided pain for the approach of your child. So now what you're going to get is not a growl, but an absolute that that dog will not want that child to approach. So please be careful, including invisible fences again for another day. Get a puppy with the full understanding that getting a puppy is like raising another infant or toddler. There will be lack of sleep, lack of time, and full supervision or management is necessary. There's, it's just black and white. That's all there is. Some sanity savers. Food puzzles. Um, all the time, anything and everything. I have buckets and buckets of food puzzles. Long lines, 30 feet, foot, even 15, dog walkers, doggy daycare, anything to really lighten your load. Shoes, baby gates, freestanding gates, treat dispensing machines are amazing. I've got a video. Quick and easy crazy tips and don't get two. So do not get another dog until your single dog is trained. That's another mistake. So what to do? Um, I love this video so much. This is my Sooner dog uh, with my grandson, actually. Um, 
I love that he's saying good boy. That's a default behavior. <laughs> so I trained both the dog and the kid how to do crate training. Coaching the toddler to tell him he's a good boy, which I think is such a valuable lesson. <laughs> So he's elevated on the bed. Sooner's not allowed on the bed unless invited. Um, we're doing repetitions of crate training here. I love that. Um, such a fun one, such a fun one for kids. I'm obviously a lover of crate training and toddlers, but love, love, love this for any age group. It's so safe, so rewarding. Your dog, especially when you're free shaping it. Oh my gosh, I just got really excited. Here's another one. That's another, sorry, here's another one. Um, he's elevated again, you see sooner. <laughs> um, we're crate training this little pug puppy here. And we're, we free shaped this. So I just gave him her breakfast. And <laughs> sooner knows to lay down. Yeah. And I'm praising the toddler as well as the puppy and teaching them how to properly engage, which is one of my most favorite things. I really, really love it. Because I think it teaches the kids such a nice opportunity of, of what's appropriate and to recognize when your dog is being good. Um, here's another one. We did a lot of things. So he's separated and elevated here. Elevated is for safety. And Sooner knows to default whenever that hand goes up. So I taught Sooner um, that if the hand goes up, uh, he has to lay down. So that was a safety thing that I did for toys um, and around the kids. So even if they had something in their hand, um, he always knew to lay down. Um, this is another super cute one. She's marking it, feeding it. He knows not to jump and she feeds it on the floor because he was a bit of a shark. I love this. I thought this was so cute. <laughs> um, and he was a puppy here. Yeah. All right, I love that one too. Um, circle time. I'm gonna go over this really quickly. It's a longer video, but um, I love this for younger kids too. So you can do handling and grooming here, um, but you wanna teach them, you'll notice my leg is in between the tiny human because I wanna create a bit of a barrier, but I want to just teach them appropriate touch and to be calm when we're sitting down. This is a great one. We did get questions about nighttime routine. I love doing this at nighttime. So I'm saying that you want to be able to be there and say, yes, I'm trying to teach my toddler how to properly pet you. And likelihood is that it's going to be a bit of a learning curve. And so I want to be there to reinforce saying, yes, every time my toddler touches you, you're going to get a cookie. He was this golden was just working for dinner. Um, I believe this video is on Instagram, so I'm not going to bore you with the full tutorial. But I call this circle time because this is still what they call this at preschool and kindergarten. It's just a time that everyone kind of comes together and has a job. And 
Cool. This is name game. This is one of my ultimate, the most important thing your dog really can know is their name. So is this Sooner as a puppy? She's just saying his name and feeding. We're just conditioning the name. Really simple. Love that one for kids. It's such a good, easy one. Um, here we're doing um, a mat training exercise. This is Robbie as like a baby baby. I'm with a born train and Sooner. So I'm letting him feed, but you'll also notice that I'm feeding and he's on my lap. He was previously terrified of dogs. So I'm teaching them here to relax on a mat, which is great because you're teaching a toddler to, or kid, dogs to relax around kids, which is a great, fabulous conditioned emotional response to have. I thought it was super great. He loved mat training. Here I am again, don't mind my outfit. Um, this was after um, the pool. So here I'm trying to desensitize Millie to being touched. So I actually do want him to touch um, and I'm gonna feed because she had a lot of tiny humans and she was already doing the grumbling and the growling. So I wanted to teach her that you can be touched um, but you're also gonna get a cookie. My preference would that be he used one hand um, but he was also still learning. So we're going through a process now. Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> so I'm shaping him to work with the dog. So it's really important that you can do both, that you can work with your toddler. Oh, yeah, there he goes, so cute. Um, and work with the dog. So I love this example. I'm talking to the camera, which I muted. Um, and then there's two dogs here. And again, I'm using myself um, in between. Uh, this is a great example. This is for the parents that are overwhelmed. I was doing the dishes with, you can hear the cartoons, kids were running everywhere. And I'm using our remote control treat dispenser. He's actually tethered to the table here um, because the kids are running and doing all the things and I was busy with the dishes. And so I had it on a downstate function to just reward him for being in his station. So I'm trying to clean up the kitchen and all the kids are running. And then this is stationing during meals. So my preference um, so that there wasn't any sort of altercations around food, not that there would be, but um, is, a, is a mat behavior, which is excellent for toddlers and expecting babies. I love this picture. We're gonna go into some cute pictures. This is Bella and Sooner Dog. Again, I love this. Notice that she's not actually like touching or invading his space. Um, and he walked up, uh, he laid up next to her and um, you can see on the edge, there's a human right here next to her. And I'm, I'm actually taking the picture on the other side. Other tips and guidelines. Um, teach your kids and dogs the power of doing nothing. So, so often our dogs or our kids are so exciting and the dogs have that conditioned emotional response. Like the toddler runs and there's a Barbie and they bite the Barbie. And it's so important that they learn just to do nothing around each other. Um, keep puppies on leash with kids all the time. It's so easy. It will make your life exponentially easier. You can reward them for not running and chasing because they can't actually run and chase, which prevents any further rehearsal of the behavior that you don't actually want in the future. So you'll prevent chasing, nipping, and that conditioned arousal around them. And you can capture in the roar the behaviors that you would like to see in your adult dog. So that's one of my favorite. Man, when I had kids and puppies, <laughs> I had puppies just station to me um, and I would go around with their breakfast and just reward them for the nice behaviors and man it made such a difference that it made my life so much easier I make sure again I've told this I've said this before but set your kids and dogs up for success so teaching early door manners threshold training meaning please don't go out that front door stationing for meals furniture privileges will really help prevent future issues um, my dog uh, kids have a hard time closing doors it's just a thing and I taught mine to run the opposite way to find me and one time I remember that um, people were coming in with groceries and it was like every door in my house just went wide open and my dog actively ran away to the other side of the house and I was so grateful because we do live on a street um leash train together so adult can hold a leash you can put two leashes so you really have most of the control here but you can have um you know one of your kids holding the same leash together um, or a separate, you know, kind of like a fake leash so that they don't get hurt, um, but they can feel involved or you can hold their hand. Train together, like I said, I showed you some examples. And remember arousal, if there's a lot of nipping, running, chasing, you're conditioning that with your, with your children. 
And remember that puppies come nipping and biting. So it's actually our job to prevent it and to teach your kids and puppy the proper interaction. So so many people are like, well, how do I stop my puppy that's biting my kids? And the answer is, let your puppy have access to tiny humans because your puppy is biting. So unless you're there actively rewarding and shaping the behavior, there actually should not be any access. So that is your job specifically. I know that might be some tough news, but so here's some pictures. I love this. Again, this is my house. I'm probably biased, um, but they're just coloring and the, the dogs are so, they've been so heavily rewarded for doing nothing around the kids that it's nothing. And this allows inclusion, safe inclusion. Here's more power of doing nothing. I think we actually have four dogs. There's another one over here. Um, such a nice, nice thing. And on this note, I just wanna talk really about teaching our kids the, how to set our dogs up for success. Um, I was out for a lesson and the kids were playing that like dance dance game um, and the dogs were really overstimulated and I had frozen food puzzles in the freezer and I came home and all the dogs were up with frozen food puzzles because they said that they thought it would be best if the dogs went to their crate when they were doing their um, PlayStation game and I about melted because I thought that is I gave everyone money and candy. <laughs> I rewarded everyone for great decisions but I thought that was so lovely that um, I had been able to teach the kids such nice behaviors. Um, I also have a video on Instagram that a kid made me, um, and she's talking about teaching dogs the power of choice, which I, again, melted because I think we have such a wonderful opportunity to teach our kids so many learning lessons with dogs, the power of choice, the power of reinforcement. Um, not using force to learn that learning can be fun and it can be engaging and it can be an opportunity, not a risk. Um, I love obviously working with kids and dogs and I think there are really endless learning opportunities, the power of unconditional love and acceptance, um, personal, personal bubbles, um, personal space, um, consent. There's just so many things, responsibility. I just, I, I love it so much. Um, which is why I have my friends send me cute pictures. Um, okay, and then we are wrapping up. I know I went really fast and um, there was a lot to cover and I barely touched the surface, but um, these are just some of my favorite quotes. So until one is loved an animal, a part of one's soul remains unawakened. I certainly grew up with animals, obviously, um, and some of my greatest memories are with my dogs. Um, dogs have a way of finding the people who need them, filling an emptiness we don't even know we have. And again, I feel so strongly about this with kids and dogs. Um, and lastly, dogs do speak, but only to those who know how to listen. And I think it's our job to teach our kids how to listen to the dogs. Um, and I think it's such a, again, such a wonderful opportunity. But that is it. Um, so hopefully, that was a lot, um, um, but there's so much, and I could talk for probably an entire month on this, but um, but if you want, um, I'm okay to take questions, it's up to you. Yeah, that's awesome, Jen. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, please be brave. We've got, we've got a little bit of time for those who can stick around, yeah. and again, this will be recorded. Um, if you have any other questions, again, you are welcome to reach out and book a consult with Jen. Um, you can reach out to us as well. I know some of you had questions that were maybe not exactly kids and dogs, but some other related issues you wanted to um, get some more information on. So feel free to reach out to Jen or reach out to us. But if you have questions now, uh, just drop them in the chat box for us. Yeah. We'll give it a minute and see who's brave. Uh, the recording will be on YouTube, but we'll make sure that we email everybody um, who is on our guest list so that you have that. We also usually post the recordings um, to our Facebook and Instagram um, and all that kind of stuff. So Christina yeah. says, I'm having a baby in February and I'm looking for resources on how to introduce our baby to the puppy. Our puppy will yes. be one year old when the baby is born. Yes. Okay. Um, love this. There's a lot of behaviors that I, I went over some of them that I think are important. So learning to be happily, um, calmly separated. I think a mat behavior, not necessarily a place, but a place is helpful. But again, um, I would prefer a place to be a happy place, not a coerced, like forced location, because that can ruin everything. Um, 
and threshold training, not jumping, getting used to a new schedule, your schedule is going to be wonky. Um, also making sure that you've got resources around your delivery time. So is there someone who can come take care of your dog? Um, and even when you come home from the hospital, that can be really overwhelming. So having additional support, making sure your dog has had all of its needs met. And in the meantime, I recommend bringing all your baby stuff in as soon as you can. So the swing, the rocking of the swings and even the toddler stuff, so strollers. If you can get your dog walking next to a stroller before your baby comes, oh, being able to walk your dog and your baby together is everything. Um, and then slowly, I, I touched on this more, but again, feel free to reach out to Family Paws as well. They are like the, you know, experts, experts, experts. I've only lived it. Um, I would say things that we mentioned, so don't force, don't force the baby into the dog. Focus on inclusion, but not by force. So if there's curiosity, you can reward it. If the dog would like to be close, reward it. Um, I also, you can look on YouTube and there's even a CD that you can buy that's dog and kid sounds, so like baby sounds. So desensitizing to sounds, to movement, to toys, leave it and drop it are amazing. Um, and even, this is a little advanced, but it's one of my favorite things to do, but teaching a dog that if something drops from above, that that is an automatic default to not touch. So a little bit advanced, but you can can't transfer the cue, which is like a whole other topic, but um, one of my favorite things to train to prevent any sort of um, obstructions, um, poisoning, and, and again, the stationing exercises, and for sure, a treat dispenser and lots of food puzzles. So Jay so Jenna, oh, said, oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, Jay I'm so says, excited. What's have you ever worked, uh, sorry, we will have a baby in February. How do we introduce a baby to a generalized garter who's two years old? Yeah. Okay, so guarding is super serious. Um, I would get a hold on that ASAP. So we need to identify triggers, prevent the triggers from happening, and then counter condition them Im immediately. And then at this point, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I don't test any of that. So if you know that there's a space or a location, it's separation. There should never be an opportunity for that dog to feel guarded or invaded, including outstretched hands. Dogs can guard anything that they consider a resource. So it's body, um, bones, and location. So that means they can even um, cut off a location. So like, let's say there's a corner and the baby is just moving with the dog beds over there. That's free game to guard that entire, I kind of call it like a vortex. Anything within the vortex is free game to guard. So for me, it's how are you actually going to set up your dog in your household to avoid guarding from ever occurring? Because that I know for family paws is like a non-starter. Um, so identify the triggers, start counter conditioning them now, create a setup in which the opportunity will not be um, there at all. And there will, no be, will not be any further rehearsal of the behavior. And if you need to consult with a veterinary behaviorist um, ethically, that is my response. Ah! Awesome. Sarah says, have you ever worked with start button behavior? <laughs> We're excited. Yes. Um, yeah, many, many start button behaviors. I mentioned, oh my God, uh, don't even like kids and dogs, obviously. Um, uh, sooner, but it was natural, um, will paw for the pet. Um, and he will ask for consent um, for petting. And I have taught the kids to wait for consent. So um, I've also done it with grooming. So when we're doing any sort of grooming or brushing, we wait for a start button and then I tell the kids to go. And I've, um, this is more of a default behavior, but it's the beginning of a start button. Um, with the kids, when they wanna throw, the only way that a throw goes out is if a sit happens. So the sit starts the game. Um, and oh my gosh, the crate training video that you saw, that's a start button actually, because sooner, had confinement and separation anxiety. So the start button that we were free to go was him going into his crate. So that was a start for him. Um, and that's why you heard me coaching Robbie, where I said, you could throw it in or throw it out and it's his choice. And then that's when he said he was a good boy. So yes, love that. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with start button behaviors, basically it's the idea that somebody gets to say, I'm ready to do the thing. It's a way of either the dog or you could do it with the kid saying, okay, I'm ready to play now, yes. which means that they're saying, 
I'm comfortable. So if we have a dog who might be nervous around something, having them give a start button that says, okay, you can bring the baby near me a little bit for yes. a give you a signal for that. So if you're interested in start button behaviors, it's another really cool way to gauge whether the kid or the dog is ready to take a little bit of step or engage in something. It's very, very cool. It's amazing. It gives control to either learner. So yes, I would like to. No, I don't. And if you don't want to, there's no force. Nothing happens. It's lovely. Yeah, that's awesome. So Sarah says, my sister is having her baby in March and she has a blue healer and a German shepherd. They aren't trained, but are very relaxed. How can we prepare the dogs for when the baby comes? Yeah, very similar. So make sure you start to get those scents. So including um, like creams. Um, and there's a lot of things that we don't realize that are weird novel objects. So things that make noise, even like the diaper genie um, and start preparing for separation. That's a big one. So if they haven't had any training, they may not know that they have choices. They may not have default behaviors. Um, they may not know how to settle. And so this just happened. I'm working with a Rottweiler um, who they didn't really know had high arousal because like nothing had happened really. It was just kind of like a house pet. Um, so figure that out because the, the, um, the babies will make the cooing noises and they'll smell funny and they'll be in their crib. So being able to identify and have some behaviors that you can default back to. So relaxation exercises I love. Um, relaxation protocol or protocol for relaxation is lovely. Relax on the mat is lovely. Um, I love stationing, separation, default behaviors, leave it, drop it. Just something so you have some again, all over um, manageable behaviors in the house, threshold training, recall, oh my gosh, your hands are going to be full 100% of the time. Um, and then learning different ways to exercise them. If they haven't, if they can't walk on a leash, you're going to not be able to run them or throw play fat. So figure that out. Um, so Wendy I know that's said, super general, but sorry. Wendy says, we have a rescue pup who we know is not a fan of kids and we take necessary precautions whenever we're around kids. Do you think training would help them get more comfortable with kids or is it just something we'll always need to adjust for? Oh my gosh, these people are amazing. Um, you guys are amazing. Thank you for being brave and asking. Oh my God, my Chicago accent. Um, that's a great question. And I love where your head's at. Um, and there would probably be a little bit more information before we could give a definitive answer on this. So how old is the pup? Um, do we know it's what history with kids or we just kind of know it's an overall? Do we know if it's toddlers, big kids, small kids, moving kids? Um, has there been any negative history? Can we make a positive history? I could probably ask 20 more questions. Um, I think training can help. I think start buttons would be lovely. This is a nice one, you know, on a go say hi to you or um, getting the dog really comfortable in like a safe place around kids where it knows, okay, if I am in this location, nobody touches me and I am safe. That's a lovely one. I do think there's a genetic component. It's another story for this. There's an age, there's um, brain, there's neuroplasticity. There's a lot of things happening here. I do think counter conditioning and operant conditioning can make really big changes. I think it's time contingent. Um, I think there's a play on uh, nature nurture. So what's going on in the environment. And then if there's any other underlying anxieties, which more than likely there are addressing those so that overall stress levels get reduced so that learning is in its prime state. So when you do train, it has the biggest effect on the dog. Um, man, yes, start button behaviors. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, the people who revolutionized the start button are from Clicker Expo. Um, one of the trainers is actually a horse trainer and I'm going to mess up their other names, um, but um, it's Peggy Hogan. She does a lot of cooperative care for start buttons um, and they have many. So the Karen Pryor website, the Clicker Expo website, um, Clicker Training has actual seminars on the start button, um, cooperative care and consent. Um, Laura Monica Torelli has some really nice start button behaviors. I think Hannah Brannigan is coming up with more things on start button behaviors. They're kind of popping up all over. I have some on nail trims and kids stuff. Um, but I think I would say for the most cleanest, most concise answers, probably go to Clicker Expo or um, the Karen Fire website to um, search start button. Peggy Hogan is like lovely of it. She actually is the one who showed me it and I was like, oh. mm -hmm. um, uh, but lovely, lovely information. But for sure, the um, Clicker Expo, Clicker Training website, for sure. 
Awesome. Well, Jen, thank you so much for being here oh, tonight. Oh, yeah, there is a course on oh, Tromplo. Yeah, there's a course yeah. on Tromplo. There we go. Uh, thanks for thanks for pitching in, Sarah. Um, so lots of great information tonight. I know that we went through a whole bunch. Again, I will send out the link to the recording. It'll probably take uh, till the end of tomorrow because YouTube doesn't like when I upload things. It's slow. Um, and a reminder again that if you want to get more information, you are welcome to reach out to Jen at Conscious Dog Training. Um, you're welcome to book an appointment with us. We do our free short-term consults, but we also do have paid services as well. Um, definitely check us out for future webinars. We've got one in a couple of weeks about managing a multi-dog household, one about the canine senses, and then one about behavior for senior dogs coming up in December. So lots of cool stuff. If you liked what you heard today, um, if you wanted to submit a Google review for us or a Facebook review, we would love that. Yes. And make sure you're following both of us on social media because we post really cute stuff. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jen. Have a good one. Okay, bye. <laughs>